Hello and welcome back to my channel and today I'm starting a new series all about Japanese cinema. Now I've been in love with Japanese cinema for a long time and I've come to believe it's a cinema that's as rich if not richer than American and French cinema. Every year I discover a new Japanese director I didn't know about or a new Japanese masterpiece that I didn't know about. I'm tripping over them and every era of Japanese cinema is rich. Going right back to the silent era, right to the modern era, there's never a decade when there isn't so many great films to discover. It's an extraordinary cinema. But it might seem a bit intimidating to the novice, so I thought I'd do a series of introductory videos introducing you to major directors or directors that I find interesting as a way of getting into Japanese cinema and discovering it for yourself. So today we're going to look at the classic era of Japanese cinema, which is sort of from the beginning of the sound eras or the 1930s through to the 1960s. Now, the West discovered Japanese cinema, kind of, in 1951, when Akira Kurosawa won the Best Director Prize and the Silver Lion at Venice Film Festival for Rashomon, uh, which is one of the most famous Japanese films. Japanese cinema had been very rich before then, and some cinephiles in the West knew about it, but it became a sort of well-known phenomenon from Rashomon onwards. Rashomon, you'll remember, is the story of a, uh, a samurai and his wife are walking through the woods. They're attacked, the wife is raped, and the, the samurai man is killed. And then the story is told to the audience from four different perspectives, including that of a ghost. It now, that at the time, I think, seemed quite radical to many audiences. It's been done many times since. Um, it wasn't that original, but it struck many people as being original, a bit like Pulp Fiction much later in the 90s. It's a good film. I think it's been somewhat overrated, but it is a good film. The most famous Kurosawa film is The Seven Samurai. Now, this is one of these great classic, you know, humanist masterpieces of the 1950s that I think anyone could enjoy. So if you've not seen it, get it out. It's long, but it's a wonderful movie. It's like a sort of Japanese Western, and it was the basis of The Magnificent Seven, um, about these seven samurai who come to the aid of these villagers who are under attack. And um, it's directed with real verve and style. You know, Kurosawa adopted many um, sort of Hollywood techniques, and there's a real sort of freshness and drive in his cinema. And the action sequences at the end in the rain are justly celebrated and have been much imitated. Peckinpah was very much influenced by Kurosawa in this film. So that's highly recommended. That's a good way to get into Japanese film. I'm not the greatest fan of Kurosawa. I've spoken about this before on this channel. I've always wanted to like Kurosawa more than I do. The problem with Kurosawa for me is he paints with broad brushstrokes. By which I mean that as a painter, if you like, he has a big canvas with wonderful effects, you know, big battle scenes or a, a nautical scene, but he doesn't have that precision, that psychological precision of a more delicate painter like Vermeer or Velazquez, for me anyway. I find some of the sort of... His films rely on humanist standbys, you know. I know that many people admire the film Ikiru or Living, which is about a man looking back on his life and wondering if he's wasted it. And it seems to me that it, it deals with rather simplistic ideas about who we are as human beings. I'm perhaps being a bit harsh there, but that's how I feel watching most of his films. I don't think they get to the nitty gritty. They stay on the level of sort of tried and trusted ideas about humanity. There's a lack of person intellectual personality, I suppose I'm saying about Kurosawa, that I find sometimes a bit irritating. Weirdly and ironically then, my favourite of Kurosawa film is actually probably his most simple, is a film called Dirtsu Uzawa, which he made in a kind of exile from Japan. He was becoming very disillusioned with his filmmaking in Japan. He had financial problems. And he was invited to make a film in Russia. And it's based on a, a true-life journal of this geographer and explorer, Russian geographer and explorer, who was sent to Siberia and to, to look at the terrain and he made friends with a, a local hunter and it's about their relationship it's a stunningly beautiful film very difficult to find in a good print although a new blu-ray of it is coming out next month um it's just a beautifully made film about man's relationship with the environment 
And there's one particular scene in it that, that stands out in my memory. There's this incredible scene where they're out in this plain in the tundra. And it's coming to evening and the cold is going to set in. And this hunter, the local hunter, realises they're going to die if they're, if they're out. They're going to get exposure. And there's this brilliant scene where the, the soldier is falling you know, ill in the cold. And the hunter goes into action. And what he does is he starts crazily chopping down reeds. All these reeds standing around them. It's a fantastically edited sequence. You're, like, you're on the edge of your seat. And all he's doing is chopping down reeds. This is a testament to Kurosawa's editing skill. And then what he does is, he takes the theodolite, the surveyor's theodolite, sticks it in the ground and builds a thatch round it and then hides the two men inside it like a cocoon and it saves them from the snow. It's an incredible sequence and it stayed with me more than anything else in Kurosawa's work. And that's part of the reason it's my favourite Kurosawa film. So check it out if you can. Now, when Kurosawa became famous in Venice, um, this upset quite a lot of Japanese directors because they thought they were better than Kurosawa. He was some young upstart. He's only been doing it for five years. What about all these other fantastic directors they had? They had Mizuguchi and Ozu and Narusa. These people had been working since the late 1920s. They were highly admired in Japan. What was this Kurosawa guy doing getting all these awards? Still to this day, Kurosawa is the most known name in the West. He really doesn't deserve to be. I'm not saying he's a bad director, but he doesn't deserve to be known as the best. Now, the director who was most angry about this was Kenji Mizuguchi, who had a right to think that he was probably the best director working at that time. Rather pompous figure, in my opinion. But Mizuguchi is a master. Certainly a visual master a pictorial master. I mean, his films are beautiful. They are painterly. And they have an, an extraordinary use of space. The way he uses composition and space is extraordinary. I sometimes find Mizuguchi's perfectionism a bit chilling. And I find that he goes actually for a sort of epic fable. He sort of stands back from humanity almost, instead of getting down involved with it. And so there's something rather grandstanding, sometimes rather pompous about his work that I've never quite resolved myself to. I feel that there is a, a perfectionism on the surface level and a correctness of theme, but there's a sort of missing centre. There's a lack of personality at the centre. This is a purely personal point of view because this is one of the most admired filmmakers of all time. I'm just giving you a very personal point of view here. His best known film, and a film that I think anyone could like, and you should try it, is Ugetsu, or Ugetsu, or Ugetsu Monogatari, which is, in English, Tales of Moonlight and Rain. What a wonderful title that is. Um, and this is a, a ghost story, really, about a man who meets this ghostly noblewoman who we first see wonderfully in a busy market, but there's something eerie about her with this gorgeous big hat she has. And he goes back to her house, and they enjoy this uh, idyllic but rather eerie night together. And it means that he's, he's taken away from his wife for years on end, and she suffers. So it's a kind of melodrama stroke ghost story. It's very beautiful. My personal favourite Mizuguchi film actually came from a lot further before that. In 1939, he made a film called Tale of the Last Chrysanthemum. It's set in the Meiji period, that's the late 1800s in Japan, and it's about uh, the long-suffering wife of, a, of an actor in an itinerant troupe of kabuki actors, kabuki theatre. And I think it's the high watermark of Mizuguchi's painterly compositions and filming in depth with long takes. There's a wonderful take where in the moonlight one night they walk together on this path and the camp you're down here in a sort of ditch looking up at them on this raised walkway walking to and fro very memorable scene the use of space and, and sequence shots throughout is staggering perhaps the high watermark of his you know uh, formal experimentation as a director but if you want to try something different a bit more human a bit more involved try Guillaume Biashi. 
this was a sort of contract film. He didn't really like it, but he had to make it. Made in 1953. It's sometimes known as I Am a Geisha. It's a very interesting film. It's part of a series of films that became a sort of genre in Japanese film about geisha houses. The, ma the first of these is a brilliant, very little known film in the West called Fallen Blossoms. Um, and it was made in 1938 by a director whose name I forgot, Idashi, I think. And it's a wonderful film and it's a very unusual film. The whole film is set entirely in a geisha house. It never goes outside. It's again the Meiji Civil War of the Meiji period, and that civil war is going on outside. You're only inside. There are only female characters. And one critic recognised that throughout the entire film, there is never one repeated shot. Every single shot is from a different angle. Extraordinary. So it's all set in this, this one house. You never go outside. The film it's most closely bears resemblance to is actually a film from 1999 called Flowers of Shanghai by Hu Chao Chen, which is, I think, a formal mise-en-scene masterpiece and one of my favourite films. But this gave rise, this film gave rise to a whole series of geisha films. And Mitsuguchi made his in 1953, Gion Biashi, which is set in the post-war period. It's set in modern times and looking at how prostitution has come in, you know, has developed in the, in the era of the American occupation and new ideas about women in society. And it's a really excellent film if you can get hold of it. But there was one other director that the West were going to discover. And this director was Yasujiro Ozu, the director who I believe is probably the greatest director cinema has yet given us, up there with Carl Dreyer. I was in Tower Records once, remember Tower Records? I was in Tower Records buying some DVDs and I bought a DVD of Beat the Keshi Kitano, who we'll discuss in a later video. And I went up to the counter and I handed it over and this bloke said, oh, are you into Japanese cinema? Um, and he go, you like Kurosawa? And I go, no, not really. And he went, ah, Mizuguchi. And I went, no, actually, Ozu. And he went, oh, and he stopped talking to me. Ozu tends to provoke that kind of reaction. There are those of us who love him and worship him and think he's the greatest and he is worshipped in Japan. Um, but a lot of people find his films quite boring. They watch his most famous film, Tokyo Story, which is regularly voted as one of the best films ever made, and it is. Uh, this is a film about a Japanese family coming to terms with the death of a mother. The children have sort of grown apart from the mother and they've grown selfish and don't think about their parents and the mother dies. It's a very universal film, very powerful film. And it's often quoted as the great Ozu film. And people watch that and don't watch anything else he made, even though pretty much everything else he made was a masterpiece. I mean, this is, you know, this is what he did. He specialised in showman geiki, films about common, ordinary people, about family life in Japan. And his films are sort of variations on a theme. They are very formally rigorous in the way that they're composed, the way that people are shot. They're always shot in medium shot, always facing the camera, always quite polite. So there's no sort of... There's not the sort of sturm and drang of Kurosawa or Narusa. They're very sort of modulated, poised films. But that means that the emotion, when it does leak through, leaks through so much more powerfully and potently because it seems repressed at first, and then it builds. And they're portraits of how the modern family is coping in the post-war world. Though, of course, Ozu made films in the late 20s. He made silent comedies, student comedies. And then he... he turned to sound cinema very late with a wonderful film called The Only Son in 1936. But then, you know, in, in, from the war onwards, he really specialised in Shogun Geiki. I could recommend so many films. My personal favourite, many people's favourite, is Late Spring, I think one of the greatest films ever made, about the relationship between a young unmarried daughter and her father, who is told by his family that he's got to marry her off and then he thinks, well, we're else to do the right thing. And then in trying to find her a husband, she then thinks he wants to get rid of her. And it breaks apart their love between them. It's such a moving film. It's so beautiful. It's so mysterious and also so moving. But also there's, there's a, a pair of films that I would recommend. In the 1930s, still in the silent era, 
uh, Ozzy made a film called I Was Born But, which is about two little boys who slowly lose faith in their father because their f father keeps sucking up to his boss and they start to realise that their father is not quite the man they thought he was. It's a kind of very anarchic comedy with a very freeform style. And Ozzy kind of remade it in the late 50s in a more mature, more settled, refined style in colour, beautiful colour. This, in this time, it's about the two boys who want to get a television in their house for the first time. It's a more gentle comedy, looking at each member of the family and their own desires. Something that's special to Ozu's films is the way that he cares about everyone in the family. In the film Early Summer, what's happening, the grandfather's concerns about getting old are treated with the same solemnity as those of his, you know, the son and the daughter, the working people of the family, but also of the children and what they're interested in. And that's something special in his films. Any of these films you can get hold of, they're beautiful. And please don't just stop at Tokyo Story. Watch as much of you as you can, because he is so, so beautiful. But there was a fourth major director from the classic period who remained invisible to many cinephiles in the West for many, many years. And it's only recently, actually, that he's taken his place as one of the major directors. This is Mikio Narusa. Now, Narusa, like Ozu and Mizuguchi, he was going from the early 30s, he started in silent film. From the beginning, Narusa was a little bit different. He was extremely, restlessly experimental in his early work. And when I first came across Narusa, I was a bit puzzled by him. I didn't quite know how to take him because I got used to directors having a particular style. I mean, Kurosawa, Mizuguchi, Ozu, when you're watching their films, you know you're watching one of their films, right? Narusa is not quite like that. He's not interested in developing his own personal style. He puts the style of the film at the service of the material. He's much more interested in what he's got to say. He's a social critic. He's quite abrasive, sometimes quite aggressive. He likes getting down into the rawness of society. And I found that a bit difficult at first. I couldn't quite see where the greatness was. It was actually this box set produced by Masters of Cinema that showed me where I'd gone wrong. This is a brilliant example of how a good curator of a film festival or a DVD company can really show you what a director is and really show you the best of a, a work of art. And I really admire this box set. It's the first volume of a projected series of volumes. Actually, there was no other volumes made. It didn't sell very well, apparently. And it now is out of print. So to try and get hold of it, you'll spend a fortune. The three films on this, uh, on this group are three of his best works. There is Rapast, a beautiful film um, looking at the difficulties of a young couple in post-war Japan trying to make a living and trying to get by. The director's own favourite film, Sound of the Mountain, still criminally little known in the West. Brilliant film this is, absolutely superb. Setsuko Hara, um, Ozu's favourite actress, plays a, a woman, she's living in this house uh, with her husband's family and she develops a friendship with her father-in-law that comes perilously close to putting them in difficulty. It's a very beautiful film, very, very subtle film with a lot unsaid, very gorgeous film. And best of all, my personal favourite Narusa film is Flowing, which takes us back to the geisha drama. And this is my favourite geisha film. Like Fallen Blossoms, it's set within a geisha house. And a, a widow, played by Kanuyu Tanaka, very famous uh, actress in Japan, she is forced to go and work in a geisha house, and it's kind of seen through her eyes, the changing fortunes of this geisha house in post-war Japan. Absolutely brilliant film. His most famous film uh, is Drifting Clouds, which I saw many years ago, and I, I don't remember terribly well, I'm going to be honest. Um, it's a film that stars his favourite actress, Hideo Takamina, who I think is much better in some other films. Um, she's well known in a film called When a Woman Ascends the Stairs, but I'd say watch out for a film called Lightning, which is a gorgeous movie, and again, very little known. Now, 
Those are the four big names of Japanese classic cinema. I'd like to add two others who I think have been neglected by the West. The first is a director called Sadao Yamanaka. By the way, if I'm mispronouncing these names, if there are any Japanese people watching, I do apologise. Sadao Yamanaka. Now, Sadao Yamanaka has got a very distinctive reputation. He's kind of like the Jean Vigo of Japanese film. His only three of his feature films are extant. And he died very young. He died uh, in 1939 in Manchuria, I believe. And he was a kind of rebel. He was, he was, a, he was a, an artist who was recognised, even in his youth, as being very special. And the three excellent films of his have been collected together by Masters of Cinema. And you really should check them out. And really, if you have not seen Humanity and Paper Balloons, I mean, if there's one film I want to get across in this video, Humanity and Paper Balloons, made in that great year of cinema, 1939, and it stands comparison with any movie made in that year. When I first saw this film, I had got so weirded out by it because it was like watching Robert Altman about 30 to 40 years before Robert Altman got going. It's this portrait of this community. It's a, a Jedi geiki. It's a, a period costume drama. But it, it, it doesn't just focus on one person. There is a central couple in it. But it focuses... You, you jump between all the different people in their neighbourhood. And some, sometimes you're following this story, then you go back to that story, then you go back to the main story. And I was amazed by this. I thought, wow, this was being done in Japan years ago. That, that the seeds of what we would recognise as Altman-esque were there in Japan. Incredible. It's an incredible movie. It feels very much of its time, but also way ahead of its time. So if you're going to watch... One film from this video, please make it Humanity in Paper Balloons. It's a very special movie, and it gives you a clue as to what a special, very unusual and unique artist Sadao Yamanaka was. Now, another filmmaker who was recognised by his peers in the 1930s as being a major filmmaker, but is still very little known in the West, is Hiroshi Shimitsu. I think, having looked at this box set from Criterion, Shimitsu was actually at the peak of his powers in the 30s and I think was the best filmmaker working in Japan in the 1930s, even better than Ozu and Mizuguchi. Quite a claim. If you don't believe me, get this box set. I've plugged this box set before in this channel. I can't plug it enough. It's called Travels with Hiroshi Shimitsu. It's part of the Eclipse series. And again, this is a brilliant piece of DVD curatorship. The four films collected together on this volume are the best works of, I've seen so far of Shimitsu. Japanese Girls at the Harbour, a late silent film, which is so beautiful and experimental and fresh and clever. It's amazing, the relationship between, the relationship between these two Japanese schoolgirls and then one of them commits a crime and her downfall. Absolutely amazing film. So, the, the experimentation is as good as anything in European or American film at the time. Mr. Thank You is a better known film. It's such an unusual film from Japanese or any cinema. It's set in this, it's a bus ride from this seaside town into the city and looking at the different characters on board and their relationship with this rather jolly bus driver. And the, the relationship with this, you know, the representation of sexual politics seems so modern and so ahead of its time. Incredible film. And then there's the two last films, both set in a sort of spa resort. The Masters and a Woman, which is my personal favourite Hiroshi Shimitsu film, is a gorgeous film about these two blind masseurs, this woman and a, a guy and his rather troublesome nephew, and just their lives as they stay at this spa. It's such a beautiful, clean, limpid, fresh film. It feels like it could have been made yesterday. Ornamental Hairpin is kind of better known. It's about a romance between this soldier who's kind of cut his foot on this hairpin and this woman who owned the hairpin. It's a very beautiful, very poignant film, very clear and sharp, but also very, very light and moving. Gorgeous. These films are so good. Shimitsu is better known in the West for his films about children, like Children of the Beehive, uh, children who were sort of displaced during the war, or who were homeless before the war. 
Uh, Children in the Wind is another film of his that he made on a similar theme. He's better known for those films that are kind of neo-realist. I think those films on that box set are much better. So that's the classic age of Japanese cinema. Next time I'm going to be looking at the sort of nouvelle vague, new age era of the 1960s. And if you like my content, as always, please like and subscribe.